Good morning. Welcome to Cherry Hill Presbyterian Church. Please join me in the call to worship which is printed in your bulletin. Cry out with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into God's presence with singing. Whose mercy is everlasting. And whose faithfulness endures to all generations. Let us worship God. join me in prayer. God of all time and space, you initiated the relationship of love and generosity with creation at a time before and beyond all knowing. Through the Word and the Spirit, you continue in eternal love for all beings. Fill us with a deep abiding awareness of your presence your call, and your grace in our lives and in our world. Shape us into the people you have made us to be, poured out in creative mercy for the sake of Jesus Christ in all creation. Amen. Despite our best intentions, our days have been marred by thoughts and actions that pull us away from God and distort our relations with other people. We need to be restored to integrity and self-respect and freed from the burdens of our mistakes. Honest confession and acceptance of forgiveness from God can turn our lives around. So let us draw near to God in prayer to receive this precious gift. Let us pray. Lord of mercy, there are so many times in our lives when we feel alone, we wonder where you are. We cry out to you in our confusion, pain, and hurt. 
and when you do not immediately grant the prayers of our cries, we begin to doubt that you even care or exist. Stop us from going down this path of self-destruction. Help us look around and find the many ways in which you have blessed our lives. Forgive us when we are so quick to doubt and so arrogant in our demands of your responses. Give us a spirit of patience and willingness to be ready to hear your voice. Strengthen us for the ministries of love and hope that you have placed before us. God is indeed merciful to all who truly seek a new way of life. If we have come truly seeking God's way rather than our own, be assured that we are forgiven. We are free to sing a new song. We are free to leap for joy. We are free to treat others as we want to be treated. So friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. This morning, we have the special joy and privilege to celebrate the baptism of Caitlin Page Rooslink. Caitlin is a member of this year's confirmation class and will be received into membership two weeks today with the other member, with Nick Thorpe, who is also part of the class. And Caitlin, I would invite you, please, to come forward at this time. Representing the session in the sacrament of baptism is our clerk of session, Mary Boudreaux. Stand right here. Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Obeying the word of our Lord Jesus Christ, and sure of his presence with us, we baptize those whom he has called to be his own. Caitlin, in Jesus Christ, God has promised to forgive our sins and has joined us together in the family of faith, which is his church. 
He has delivered us from darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. In Jesus Christ, God has promised to be our Father and to welcome all of us as brothers and sisters in Christ. Know that the promises of God are for you. By baptism, God puts God's sign on you to show that you belong to God and gives to you the Holy Spirit as a guarantee that sharing Christ's reconciling work, you will also share his victory. That dying with Christ to sin, you will be raised with him to new life. In presenting yourself this morning for baptism, you announce your faith in Jesus Christ and show that you want to study him, know him, love him, and serve him as his chosen disciple. So I ask now that you show your purpose by answering these questions. Is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, and do you trust in him? If so, please say, he is and I do. He is and I do. Do you intend to be his disciple, to show his love, and to obey his word? Do you? Our Lord Jesus Christ ordered us to teach those who are baptized. Do we, the people of the church, promise to tell this new disciple the good news of the gospel, to help her know all that Christ commands, and by our fellowship to strengthen her family ties with this household of God? If so, please say, we do. We do. We do. Okay, thank you, please. Let us pray. God, our creator, we thank you for your faithfulness promised in this sacrament and for the hope we have in your son, Jesus. As we baptize with water, baptize us with Holy Spirit so that what we say may be your word and what we do may be your work. By your power, may we be made one with Christ our Lord in common faith and purpose. By the power of your Holy Spirit, bless this water. Grant that she who is washed in this water may be cleansed of sin and be born anew. Bind her to the household of faith and guard her from all evil. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon her that she may be strengthened to serve you with joy until that day when you make all things new. To you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, be all praise, honor, and glory, now and forever. Amen. Caitlin Page, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Spirit of God present in your life. Amen. Caitlin, you are now a disciple of Jesus Christ. He has commissioned you. Live in his love and serve him. Members and friends of Cherry Hill Presbyterian Church, I, it's my pleasure to introduce to you your new sister in Christ, Caitlin Page Bruceling. Let us pray. Almighty God, giver of life, you have called us by name and you've pledged to each of us your faithful love. Today we pray in a special way for Caitlin. Watch over her, guide her as she grows in faith, give to her understanding and a quick concern for neighbors. Help Caitlin to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ who was baptized your son and servant and who is our risen Lord. 
Holy God, remind us of the promises given in our own baptism and renew our trust in you. Make us strong to obey your will and to serve you with joy. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Caitlin, you may go back to your seat. As wherever you go in life, do know that God goes with you and the prayers of your church family go with you as well. Amen. At this time in our service, our children are excused for Sunday school as, as you go. May God's blessing be with you as you continue to live and to grow in God's goodness, God's amazing grace, and God's endless love. Welcome again to worship today, whether you worship here in the sanctuary or if you're worshiping with us at home or wherever through our live stream broadcast. Please know that it has been our prayer this past week that this time of worship today would be a time of spiritual renewal for all of us for the living of these days. If you are here in the sanctuary, we invite you to please sign the red covered friendship pads, which are at both ends of the pews. And if you're worshiping with us on Facebook, simply send us a greeting uh, to let us know that you are with us as well. You will note in the bulletin, and you, if you're on our email list, you received word this past week that our session has uh, voted due to the increase in the number of COVID cases in our uh, county. We are once again strongly recommending that those attending worship here in person be masked. Um, just in case you think this isn't real, we have, at, we have a few couple of our elders who are quarantined at home because they have tested positive uh, and uh, have symptoms, uh, which if you're here this morning, the session will not be meeting with the confirmation class today, as it says in the bulletin. One of those elders is Martha Whitfield, who's quarantining at home with John. Uh, John tested positive for COVID this past week, and therefore the uh, Sunday uh, Bible study group will not be meeting today uh, as well. And a big word of thanks to Rachel and Scott Golem for hosting coffee hour today at, at really a day's notice uh, when after we, were learned, we had learned about John and Martha. So we are grateful for your continued patience and for your understanding. Please take note of all of the announcements in today's bulletin. In just three weeks, we will be having our church picnic at the small shelter at Ford Field. There's more information about the picnic in the bulletin today. If you are planning on attending, there is a sign-up sheet on the table in uh, Weir Foyer for you to let us know how many are coming and what you plan to bring to share with the group. You're invited to sign up in order to help our church growth and fellowship committee plan. And then if you're planning on attending the CPR training course here at the church on Tuesday, June 7th, I'm very happy to see that 10 of the 15 places have already been reserved. There are still five openings. So if you're thinking about planning on attending that CPR training, I would invite you to sign up as soon as possible. Our thanks to the ladies of the choir this morning for, for their special music that they will share with us uh, as part of today's service. So again, welcome to worship, and now may we continue in our worship of God.
A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 15 through 21. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words that are spoken and heard and in our lives enacted be faithful and true and formed by your grace, O God. For it is in the Savior's name that we pray. Amen. There is an African tribe whom I read about some time ago whose family customs are rather unique. Father is the hunter, the uh, gatherer. Mother tends the home camp, cares for the children, and keeps the fire burning, cleaning the hut, and so on. But when this whole family is together at the end of the day, sitting or lying around the glowing embers of their fire, they are so close to each other that they are literally touching each other. A foot against a leg, a hand on an arm. It's an amazing thing to see. When this family is together, they are really together. Their custom of touch bearing witness to their closeness, their, uh, their interconnectedness, their dependence on each other, their love for each other is real. And when dad is out hunting and gathering food, mom and children are carrying on with this interconnectedness until he returns always in touch with one another. It has been discovered that human touch is the most powerful communicator of our emotional connection or disconnection with another, along with one's presence with another. But nowhere is this more important than in our family, so much so that there is a condition which young children can experience when their parents leave them with relatives or with babysitters or on the first day of school or at some other place. Whenever they are left by their parents, children can experience what's called separation anxiety disorder. And it can be rather traumatic for both the child and the whole family. Separation anxiety involves the feeling of excessive and inappropriate levels of anxiety over being separated from a person whom the individual has a strong emotional attachment or place. I think we find Jesus' friends in full separation anxiety mode this morning. The biblical scholars call this section from which John read, from the fourth gospel, the gospel according to John, Jesus' farewell 
discourse. It is the last evening of Jesus' life, and Jesus and his disciples are at table for what would be their last supper. It's a time for summing everything up. It's, it's a time for final words, for final instructions. The occasion is heavy. It's pregnant with significance. John gives it several chapters, including Jesus' long prayer for his disciples, in which he asks God to protect them, to keep them together, to give them joy, and to send them out into the world in his name. Now, this reading this morning may seem like an odd text for the season of Easter, for this sixth Sunday of Easter, in which we're celebrating our life together in the post-resurrection time. It almost seems as if we're going backward instead of forward. And yet, we need to be reminded of what Jesus promised would sustain his disciples in his absence especially in those moments when they would be out on their own. Go home and read more from this farewell discourse of Jesus, and you'll discover that Jesus is repeatedly telling his disciples that he's going away. In a little while, you will no longer see me, he says. But don't worry, it's going to be an exciting new day. And yet, they can't see that. As renowned preacher Fred Craddock says, Jesus' followers are confused. They are like children playing on the floor only to look up to see mom and dad putting their coats on. The children have three questions, always three questions. Where are we going? Can we come? Who will stay with us? And Jesus responds, I'm going to my father and your father. You cannot come with me now. You can come later. But I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm not going to leave you alone. I will send you another friend, another helper, who will never leave, but who will stay with you forever. I will not leave you orphaned, Jesus says. I'm going away, but I won't leave you as orphans. When we think of orphans, we instinctively think of children without parents, but in fact, the English word orphan comes from the Greek orphanos, meaning bereaved or bereft or deprived. So I will not leave you orphaned. I will not leave you bereft. I will not leave you deprived. I will not leave you alone, Jesus tells his frightened, anxious friends in the midst of separation, anxiety, disorder. And then he offers them a promise. Did you hear it? I'm coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me. I will ask my Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. The advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and will remind you of all that I've said to you. Now, what does Jesus mean here? I mean, who or what is this advocate he's promising? Some versions of the Bible translate the Greek word as counselor. The word comes from the language of the courtroom. An advocate who will stand with you, who will speak on your behalf. Jesus goes on to call this advocate the Spirit of Truth, and a little bit later, the Holy Spirit. Advocate and Spirit seem to be one and the same in this gospel, but this advocate, this Spirit, this Counselor will abide with them, 
will make their home with them. This advocate, counselor, spirit, whatever, will empower them to love one another, even as Jesus had loved them. But more than that, through the presence of this spirit, Jesus will still be with them, even when he's gone away even when they can no longer see him. <laughs> Those disciples must have been as confused as we are as we listen to his words. I mean, they could see Jesus sitting there at the table with them. They could feel his touch as he bent down to wash their feet. They could hear his words now as he talked with them. But how in the world would they be able to see, feel, or hear this strange advocate that he's speaking of? How could they really believe that they weren't going to be orphaned, bereft, alone? How can you and I, sitting a long way from that table where Jesus sat with his disciples, believe all this? If Jesus' words are true, then that spirit was not limited to just his disciples over 2,000 years ago. This Holy Spirit is also our advocate. That is, the promise is good for us also whenever we feel abandoned, bereft, alone. In the midst of of those moments for us. Jesus says, I will not leave you orphaned. I'm coming to you. But it's not, it's not easy to talk about this Holy Spirit, this advocate. It hasn't been easy over the centuries since Jesus' time. Have you ever noticed how the Spirit almost always comes in last place behind God and Jesus? Theologian Elizabeth Johnson offers a lighthearted guess to explain the neglect of the Holy Spirit. She says, perhaps toward the end of their long constructive discourses, all of the theologians simply get tired when it comes to the Spirit. But she's very serious in lamenting our neglect of the Spirit for what she says, what is being neglected is nothing less than the mystery of God's personal engagement in the world. No wonder we often feel like orphans. Have you ever felt like an orphan? Have you ever felt bereft, alone? Jesus didn't want it to be this way. Still, the promise of the Spirit Advocate was at the heart of Jesus' last conversation with his disciples. Through the Spirit, Jesus would continue to be with the disciples even though he'd soon be gone. The language of John's gospel often sounds circular, almost con convoluted. He says, I'm in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. But even Jesus had a hard time describing the work of the Spirit in human language. Often he, he used images or pictures of something that people knew to help them understand what they could not see. Remember, he said, I am the vine, you are in the branches. The Spirit will keep this relationship close with Jesus after he's gone. The Spirit is the point where God actually arrives. The Spirit is God's active presence in this world. The Spirit is God's active presence in your life and mine. I mean, have you ever felt the warmth of God, the activity of God within you? Have you ever had those moments in your life where you just knew you weren't alone? 
Barbara Lundblad, Professor Emerita of Preaching at Union Theological Seminary in New York, tells of a young woman who had not gone to church much, even as a little girl. But as Professor Lundblad retells the story, she remembers clearly that this happened on a Good Friday. Not long before, this woman had broken up with a man that she loved, and her life seemed to be in shambles. She got off early from work and went home. She didn't want to see anybody or go any place. Even the daylight was too much for her, and so she went into her bedroom, pulled the blinds, and turned off all the lights. She was a great lover of music, so she lay there in the darkness listening to Bach's B minor mass. As the music filled the room, suddenly she sensed that the room was filled with light, unexplainable light, light surrounding her with this presence she couldn't name. Words were inadequate to describe the experience to anyone else, yet the experience was as real as her own breathing. She just knew she wasn't alone. That Good Friday was the beginning of her journey into the community of faith, and a year later she was baptized at the Easter Vigil. And Professor Lundblad concludes her story by saying, in the eyes of memory, I can still see her standing at the baptismal font in the circle of candlelight. The spirit that had filled her lonely room, her lonely life that night with light, had led her to the water. Perhaps you've had an experience like that. Or perhaps you never have. But don't worry too much about that. You're in good company. I mean, don't worry if you cannot name a time or a place or an experience of the Spirit. If you can't do that, don't worry. It doesn't mean that the Spirit somehow passed you by. Dr. Joseph Sittler was a pastor for many years, and he also taught theology at the University of Chicago. He longed for an experience of the Spirit's presence in his life, one of those life-transforming moments. But it never came. Still, Joseph Stittler trusted that God was with him, even if he couldn't name one particular experience of assurance. The Spirit still touched him in the words of Scripture, in the hymns, in music, in art, in the beauty of nature. He knew through just everyday experiences that he wasn't alone. He simply knew he wasn't alone. I will not leave you orphans, Jesus says to his disciples and to us. I will not leave you bereft. I will not leave you alone. Yes, in a little while the world will no longer see me. But you will see me. You will know me in a deeper way than before. I promise you this, he says. I wonder if anybody here is familiar with the book the, in, entitled The a Railway Children. It's a children's book by Edith Nesbitt. It was originally published in London Magazine in 1905 and was published in book form the same year. It has been adapted for the screen several times, of which the 1970s film version is best known. This story, The uh, Railway Children, concerns a family who had to move out from London to a house out in the shires near a railway. Their move was forced upon them after the father, an intelligent, high-ranking civil servant, was unjustly imprisoned for espionage, but is eventually exonerated. 
in their new environs, the three children, Bobby, Peter, and Phyllis, they befriend an older gentleman who normally takes the morning train from near their home. He becomes an, an unlikely hero, for in his empathy for the children, he's moved to help prove their father's innocence, thereby reuniting the family. But before the father is freed, however, the family care for a Russian exile who came to England looking for the lost, his, his lost family. And the railway family take also take in Jim, the grandson of the older gentleman. For a good part of this film, the family and the children are effectively orphaned. But the climax is beautiful. The train pulls in and stops, and Bobby alone stands on the plate platform, and she waits, not knowing if her father is there. The entire scene is consumed with the smoke of the, and the steam of the uh, locomotive. And out of the clouds, her father emerges. And she knows She's an orphan no longer. I will not leave you alone, Jesus tells us today. I'm coming to you. I promise. I will not leave you. Those are good words for us to hold on to in these days. For there is so much that causes us to feel bereft, alone, abandoned. But in the midst of all of that, the promise is still there. The spirit, the advocate is still there with us. So I just leave you with this. Leonardo Boff is a Roman Catholic priest who spent most of his life working among the poorest of the poor of South America. The spirit remains the source of hope for him and for his communities as they work for justice. Boff's words about the spirits can be words of assurance for you and me when it seems like the spirit has gone away. Listen to what he writes. The spirit is that little flicker of fire burning at the bottom of the woodpile. More rubbish is piled on, rain puts out the flame, wind blows the smoke away, but underneath everything, an ember still burns unquenchable. That's the spirit. That's the spirit that sustains the feeble breath of life, he writes, even in the empire of death. Are you suffering from some form of separation anxiety this morning? Have you come here feeling alone, as if nobody understands? Nobody cares. Nobody can relate to what I'm going through. Have you come here this morning feeling as if maybe the spirits passed you by? If so, hear Jesus' words one last time. I will not leave you orphaned. I won't leave you. I promise you. I will come to you. I will send my spirit to be with you forever. That promise remains true for you and for me. 
And even if at times it seems as if the rubbish and the rain have destroyed that spark of faith within you, I pray that the wind of the Spirit will blow the dying embers to life again and again and again. For there's nothing that this old world can do to us that will ever be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.
Let us say what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed, which may be found in the bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we give you thanks for forming us fearfully and wonderfully in your image and for kindling within us the knowledge of your love, your love for each one of us and for all creation. We give you thanks for teaching us through nature and stories and songs and through other people who have lived lives of courage and power, love and discipline, whose affection and teaching and modeling have nurtured our faith and enabled us to live lives of gratitude, hope and joy. We hear your promise that you will never leave us, that you will not leave us as orphans, you will not leave us alone. And yet we must confess, Lord, there are times when we feel alone. Even the events of this past week sometimes cause us to wonder we pray for those who have suffered loss this week in Gaylord as a result of tornadoes. For those among us who are sick, we pray for healing. For those in pain, we pray for relief from pain. For those who are lost, we pray for guidance. For those who grieve, we, we pray for comfort. For those who are afraid, we pray for courage. For those who feel hopeless, we pray for hope. Remember, we remember our neighbors in prison, those who hunger, and those without a safe place to call home. Pour out your spirit into all the troubled areas of our world, so in need of your good news, your creativity, your peace, your hope, your assurance. We continue to pray for the victims of last weekend senseless violence in Buffalo, New York, and Laguna Woods, California. We pray for those terrorized by horrific shootings. And we lament for the lessons the sh these shootings and so many others have taught us over and over again about hate and racism, lessons so costly, lessons so undeniable and so unrelenting. We pray for those who have lost loved ones, those who have been injured, and for communities whose lives are changed forever 
and whose lives are, have been challenged in a matter of minutes by some madman's mindless madness. Oh, we pray that your people would find comfort in your saving grace. O day of peace that dimly shines through all our hopes and prayers and dreams, guide us to justice, truth, and love, delivered from selfish schemes. May swords and guns of hate fall from our hands, our hearts find release, Till by your grace our warring, troubled world shall see Christ's promised reign of peace. All this we pray in the name of your Son, our Lord. And we pray now as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
and now go back into this good day in peace. Be of good courage. Hold on to those things which are good. Return no person evil for evil. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor, serve, love one another, even as God in Christ has loved and served you. And remember, we are not left here in this world as orphans. We go through no moment of any day alone. For as Jesus promised, remember, I am with you always, even until the end of time. So go in peace and in hope, and may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and with all those whom you love and with all those whom only God loves, now and forever. Amen.